The New York Knicks are without a doubt one of the three giants of the National Basketball Association. Founded in 1946, you'd expect this franchise to be like its counterparts in Boston and Los Angeles, but in every single way, shape, and form, it is the ugly duckling of the three. The Knicks have been to the NBA Finals eight times and have only won twice, with their most recent championship coming in the year 1973. Since then, the Knicks have been back twice and lost both meetings, with no trips to the Eastern Conference Finals since the turn of the century. This team has been mired in controversy, terrible basketball play, and an owner that the fans have completely turned against at times, but in the face of that, the Knicks still remain as one of the most iconic teams in the NBA. Playing in the timeless Madison Square Garden and actually having some competitive rosters over the past three years, but what about their all-time players? Who are the Knicks that stand at the pinnacle of the franchise with no championships in the past 50 years? Well, let's find out on today's episode of the Case for Franchise Goat. Yo, what's up everybody, it's your boy 2KJ here, and today we're back for another episode of Case for Franchise Goat. This time we're taking a look at one of the most iconic NBA teams of all time in the New York Knicks, and seeing what kinds of all time players have suited up for such a legendary franchise. If you like the content, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, ring that bell, and let me know who you want in the comments section below. But let's take a look at our Goat Pyramid and see who we're working with. On the fan favorites tier, we have current Knicks star Jalen Brunson, Carmelo Anthony, Jeremy Lin, Charles Oakley, and Bill Cartwright. In the all-timer tier, we have Earl Monroe, Harry Gallatin, Carl Braun, Richie Guerin, and Dave DeBoucher. In the GOAT status, we have three players who I think stand on top, Walt Frazier, Patrick Ewing, and Willis Reed. But before we get to those players, let's start from the bottom and work our way up from the top. Jalen Brunson got his start playing as Luka Doncic's backcourt mate in the Dallas Mavericks. He had his breakout season during that 21-22 season and hasn't looked back since. The Mavs didn't want to give him the contract he wanted, so he left to go play with Julius Randle in the Garden. Since then, he's blossomed into a premier guard in the NBA and an absolute star. His playoff performances have been the stuff of legends, and the sixth year guard of Villanova is averaging a career high with 26 points per game to go along with 6.4 assists and 3.9 rebounds. He's also shooting an unreal 43% from the three and 47% from the field overall. Brunson has catapulted the Knicks from perennial laughing stock to real contender in the past two years, and his legend will only be growing from here. Now, a guy whose legend has already topped off Carmelo Anthony ranks as a fan favorite, mostly because he didn't really do much with his team. With his peak coming in the Eastern Conference semis lost to the Pacers that they totally should have won. Regardless, he has some incredibly iconic moments helming the Knicks and still remains as one of the most legendary scorers in NBA history. But even though we have to talk about Carmelo, we can't talk about him without bringing up his teammate, Jeremy Lin. He's not on this fan favorite tier for leading a team to the playoffs or being a Hall of Famer, but his unreal Lin Sanity run of nine games in the Knicks 2011-2012 season is the reason he's on this list. I mean, let's be honest. To give some context, the Knicks had started off the season 8-5 and five and were in big trouble in the East, featuring the Heatles who had, you know, pretty much said, this is our East for the next 5, 10, 15 years as LeBron said he'd win not one, not two, not three. You get the point. But this Knicks team was in trouble and they needed a spark any way they could get it. And that spark was Jeremy Lin. He, in this nine game span, turned into 1971 Jerry West and averaged 25 points per game, 9.2 rebounds on 50.9% field goal percentage and 33 from the three. He had four double doubles in that span and spawned one of the most iconic NBA moments of all time. Even though Lynn will never go in the Hall of Fame, the term Lynn Sanity will live on in infamy. Another guy I want to talk about who's on this list who played a very important part is Charles Oakley. Back in the 80s and 90s, the NBA was a much more physical game. A lot like hockey, you'd have guys who were on squads just to be enforcers. Now they could score and get boards and do all that stuff, but these guys were often known for their ability to keep the peace on the court and make sure opposing teams knew that they weren't soft. One of the best at this was Charles Oakley, 
Nicknamed the Oak Tree for his role in protecting a young Michael Jordan from cheap shots, he would eventually be traded to the Knicks in a deal that would send another guy on this list, Bill Cartwright, to the Bulls. He would have his best seasons as a member of this New York team and was a two-time All-Defensive NBA selection as well as an All-Star in 1994. More importantly though, Charles Oakley would play a very important part at making the Knicks one of the premier teams in the 90s, including in their seven game series finals loss against that Rockets team in 1994. During that season, Oakley started a record 107 games, meaning that he played in every single game the Knicks participated in, which is unbelievable. I mean, you can't imagine something like that happening today in, in today's basketball. But Oakley is still a fan favorite, even though, yes, he's been in a little bit of controversy over the years, but he deserves this spot on this list for sure for what he did for this franchise. Now, on that same vein, I want to talk about Bill Cartwright, because his biggest career impact was, yes, as a member of those Jordan Dynasty Bulls, providing championship experience for a squad that was about to begin a literal dynasty. But Cartwright got his start in the league as the third overall pick in the 1979 draft that featured Hall of Famers Magic Johnson and Sidney Moncrief. By this point in Knicks history, their wealth of Hall of Fame talent had pretty much dried off, as Bill Cartwright's first year actually coincided with the final year of Earl Monroe's career. This meant that the team going forward would very likely be Cartwright's, and he made sure to take full advantage of that. As a rookie, he averaged 21.7 points per game and 8.9 rebounds, landing him as an all-star as a rookie, which is pretty good, and on the all-NBA rookie team as well. While this would end up being the only all-star not of his career, Bill would settle into becoming a reliable scorer until missing the entire season with a foot injury in 1984. This would prove to be the worst timing for him, but ironically, the best timing for the Knicks as his absence would land them the number one pick in the NBA draft, a pick that they would use to select another Hall of Famer, Patrick Ewing. Now, even though he would eventually come off the bench as the backup, he still proved to be an excellent scorer's relief, and the Twin Towers in New York were still a force to be reckoned with. But with the Bulls in need of a center, they would actually trade for Cartwright in exchange for Oakley, and the rest was pretty much history. But as one of the all-time win shares leaders for the squad, he has to be on this list. Now, let's talk about some all-time players, and it is impossible to talk about the history of the Knicks without bringing up their early NBA dominance. They made it to three straight finals from 1950 to 1953, but in true Knicks fashion, they lost two of them in Game 7 and one of them in Game 5, two of those series to the Los Angeles Lakers. Remember how I said about the ugly duckling thing? But they must have had a killer team to make it this far, and well, they pretty much did. And as a matter of fact, they actually low-key had one of the first dynamic duos in NBA history, all the way back in the 50s too, which is pretty incredible. Harry Gallatin was a seven-time All-Star, two-time All-NBA, and Hall of Famer, while Carl Braun was a five-time All-Star who actually lost two years of his prime to war service, and a two-time All-NBA candidate as well, and of course a Hall of Famer. Now these two were dependable scorers who helped lead the Knicks to three straight finals appearances, and Braun had actually been in military service for two of them. So if he was playing, that might have actually turned the tide, and I think they would have been able to capture one, if not two of those final series. Later on, they'd play with another Knicks Hall of Famer, albeit just for a year, Richie Gurren. A six-time All-Star and three-time All-NBA player who got the short end of the stick for sure because he played on some terrible Knicks rosters, unlike his two Hall of Fame counterparts, but just like his Hall of Fame counterparts, he is in the Hall of Fame, and because of that and being one of the all-time win shares leaders for the Knicks, I have to put him on this squad because, you know, he belongs on there. Another all-time player who belongs on this all-time tier is one of my favorite players of all time and a guy that has pretty much been lost to time unless you really know ball. Earl Monroe, for his time, was the prototype to the high-flying, fast-break running, circus-shot-making players that we see in the NBA today. Not only was he a hooper in every single sense of the word, he has some of the most fire nicknames I have ever heard in my entire life. I mean, we've got people like Playoff P running around, but back in the day, they had Earl the Pearl, that was his trademark of course, 
Einstein, Black Jesus. Yes, that was actually the uh, inspiration for the name Jesus Shuttlesworth in the movie He Got Game. And my personal favorite, Earl the Lord's Prayer Monroe. I mean, come on. Hey, this guy's got to be a Hall of Famer just off of names alone. Coming off of college, Monroe was touted as an elite combo guard who could play both point and shooting guard. He was drafted as the second overall pick to the Washington Bullets and immediately proved that he had Hall of Fame scoring potential. As a rookie, he put up 24.3 points per game, 5.7 rebounds, and 4.3 assists, en route to winning Rookie of the Year. He had four and a half stellar seasons with the Bullets, but he would fall short to the Knicks a couple of times, and when he finally got past them, he would be swept in the 1971 Finals to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and the Bucks. During that offseason, Monroe expressed his desires to be traded to either the Bulls, Lakers, or 76ers. He would eventually be traded to his nemesis of the past, the New York Knicks, and this would form an all-time duo of Walt Frazier and Earl Monroe, a team that not really many people thought was going to work. I mean, you had two guys who led their squads in the past, two alphas. It's rare that you see them mesh well, but these guys did exactly that as they would immediately go to the finals and then immediately win it all the next year. Frazier and Monroe would form an elite all-star duo, and even though his numbers would see a slight decline, he would return back to being a 20 points per game score in the latter half of the 70s, cementing his case as a Hall of Famer and an all-time Nick by getting his number 15 jersey retired. And on that same topic, Let's talk about Walt Frazier. Coming from an outstanding college career at Southern Illinois, Frazier was drafted with the fifth overall pick in the 1967 draft, joining fellow Hall of Famer Willis Reed to try and bring the Knicks their first NBA championship in franchise history. While he only played 21 minutes per game his first year and had nine points a game, he added four rebounds and four assists, showing the potential that if he could just get a bit more playing time, he might be able to do something special on the court. And that's exactly what happened. He nearly doubled his minutes and production his sophomore year, upping his averages to 17.5 points per game, six rebounds, and eight assists, proving that Frazier could be the premier guard of the future for this Knicks team. The next seven years straight, he would rack up accolades, posting seven all-star appearances, six all-NBA selections, and seven all-defensive first-team selections as well. Not only that, both Reed basically out in a decisive Game 7 against the Lakers in the 1970 NBA Finals, he would go on to put the team on his back with a 36-point performance, shooting 12 for 17 with a perfect 12 for 12 at the charity stripe, helping the Knicks win their first NBA championship. He would help them win another one in 1973 and proved himself as an absolute star in the league, along with Willis Reed and Earl Monroe. At the time, he held most of the Knicks' all-time records, and even though since a lot of them have been broken by Patrick Ewing, his assist record actually still stands to this day. He's also unsurprisingly a member of both the 50th and 75th anniversary teams, and ranks second all-time in win shares to the Knick. But in an incredibly shocking move at the time, he was traded to the Cavs in a move that New York fans were not happy about at all. I mean, he was arguably the best player in franchise history up to this point, but he would get his due justice as his number 10 jersey would be hung in the rafters pretty much right after he retired, marking him the second Knicks player ever to get his jersey retired at that time, behind my pick for the greatest player of all time, in the Knicks jersey of course, Willis Reed. But before we talk about Willis Reed, let's talk about another important member of those finals winning teams, Dave Boucher. Dave DeBusher, as I correctly pronounce his name this time, is another player that almost kind of gets lost to time. He's one of those, oh, he knows ball kind of guys, and I'm going to explain to you why. Not only was this guy an incredible player, but he also was a major league baseball pitcher. Yeah, just let that set in. This guy pitched in the major leagues and then went to go play basketball and then made the Hall of Fame. But not just some random pitcher. I mean, he wasn't just some five ERA guy. He posted a win-loss record of three and four. We know that win-loss records don't really matter that much in baseball. But he posted a three and four win record for the Chicago White Sox, even throwing a complete game shutout against the Cleveland Indians on August 13th, 1963. He pitched from 62 to 63 until giving up the game to fully dedicate himself to basketball, 
and that was a pretty good choice, as he would end up as a Hall of Famer and on both the 50th and 75th anniversary teams. He was also an 8-time All-Star with the Knicks and Pistons, and was on all NBA defensive first team from the year he was created until he retired in 1974. In the six years he played with the Knicks, he was a reliable scoring threat, posting an average of around 15 points a game in his six seasons to go along 10 or more rebounds a game in each one of those seasons as well, in addition to being one of the premier defensive players of the league. He was a large part of the Knicks' success in the early 70s, and his elite defensive play and offensive prowess proved to be very useful in an already stacked team. I mean, the Knicks had like a big four low key, including having four Hall of Famers who are bona fide like one of the best players of their generation on the same team, in addition to all of these guys being on both the 50th and 75th anniversary teams, but there's always a star on a team. There can never be a team without a star. And the star of these Knicks teams was Willis Reed. By all accounts, Willis Reed is an all-timer in every single sense of the word. I mean, you don't just end up on both the 50th and 75th anniversary teams for no reason. He was the 1970 Most Valuable Player, has two Finals MVPs, an All-Star Game MVP, seven All-Star selections, five NBA All-Pro selections, and was also All-Defensive First Team in 1970. He was both Rookie of the Year and on the All-Rookie Team, and the most important thing is his iconic number 19 jersey is retired by the New York Knicks franchise, and he was the first player in Knicks history to get his jersey retired as well. Reed was a Knicks lifer and came into the league as the 8th overall pick in the 1964 NBA Draft. Now, Willis was an incredibly gifted big man, putting up 26.6 points per game and 21.3 rebounds during his senior year of college, and most believed that that dominating style would translate over to the NBA. He quickly would make a name for himself and prove these claims correct, as in his rookie year, he would score 46 points in a game against the Lakers and ended the season as 7th in the league in scoring and 5th in the league in rebounding, with 19.5 points per game and 14.7 rebounds. As a little aside, it does show how much of a scoring league the NBA has become, with 19.5 points per game being 7th, which is kind of crazy. But either way, he would win Rookie of the Year that year, along with being named an All-Star, which is pretty incredible, something that he would become very familiar with as he would have seven straight All-Star appearances until an unfortunate nagging knee injury would end his career at the young age of 32. But in his limited time, he showed that he is, without a doubt, one of the most talented big men of all time. In his second NBA season, his numbers would dip a bit as they moved him to power forward to open up the center position for all-star Walt Bellamy. However, to unlock his full potential, they would need to put Reed back at center. And to do that, they made a trade for a guy we just talked about, Dave DeBusschere. With Reed back at center, he would go on to shoot a career-high 52% from the field, averaging 21.1 points per game and 14.5 rebounds. It would help lead the Knicks to the Eastern Division Finals. The Knicks, seeing that this formula was the key to winning, was, funnily enough, the key to winning. The next year, they would win a franchise record 60 games behind Reed's 21.7 points per game and 13.9 rebounds, with Reed not only being named an All-Star and an All-NBA First Team selection with offense and defense, he would win the only MVP in New York Knicks history, while also winning the All-Star Game MVP to go along with it. Sweet the deal, he was also ABC's Wide Worlds of Sports Athlete of the Year and Sporting News' MVP. But we all know that none of this would matter if he couldn't capture the chip and bring that championship trophy home. He would raise his averages to 23.7 points per game and 13.8 rebounds in the playoffs and survive a close seven-game series against the Bullets and future teammate Earl Monroe. The second round, they win in five against the Bucks, setting up a finals matchup against the absolutely stacked Los Angeles Lakers, featuring Hall of Famers Jerry West, Will Chamberlain, and Elgin Baylor, name a few. This would be a seven-game war, with Reed putting his team on his back in the first four games until an unfortunate severe thigh injury and torn muscle would keep him out of Game 6 entirely. But the series on the line going into Game 7 in the Garden Reed would return and give his team the boost that they needed. 
scoring the Knicks' first four points and shooting two out of five and providing three rebounds in a win that would bring the Knicks their first finals victory in their history. Even though he had a limited role in the clinching game, his efforts to get them that far and showing up in Game 7 and giving his team that push they needed gave him his first Finals MVP trophy. His next season saw him once again be an All-Star, even though the eventual defeat by the Baltimore Bullets would halt their chances at repeating. His 71-72 season would be the beginning of the end though, as tendonitis in his left knee began to cause serious problems in his ability to play. And even as his absence, the Knicks would still go on and win the NBA finals, and even though they would be defeated, it was shaping up that the 72-73 season would be his last dance. And dance they did, because they made sure that they would go out on top as Reed helped the Knicks get out to a 57-25 record and would defeat the Bullets and upset the Celtics to book a rematch with those Los Angeles Lakers. And just like last time, they would come out on top this time in five games with Reed having 18 points, 12 rebounds, and seven assists during the Game 5 victory, in which he was named Finals MVP and retired after the 73-74 season. It's easy to see how Reed might have been one of the most dominant forces in the latter half of the 70s and might have even helped the Knicks win three out of four finals if he was healthy at 71-72 season, but either way, Reed's legacy is arguably unmatched by any Nick before or after him. For those reasons, he stands almost alone as the go to this franchise. But I said almost. There is one player who can challenge him for the throne. And of course, it's another all-time big man. Let me tell you about Patrick Ewing. Back in the day for college basketball, it was very uncommon for freshmen to start and star on the varsity team. For Georgetown University, this was much of the same except for when Patrick Ewing came to town. As a freshman, Ewing helped lead the Hoyas to their second Big East tournament title in school history and a number one seed in the NCAA tournament. They advanced to the championship game against the University of North Carolina, and yes, a young Michael Jordan would hit a clutch shot late to give the Tar Heels the lead and win them the NCAA tournament. Off the heels of that crushing defeat, Ewing would proceed to have one of the most dominant careers in NCAA history, taking the Hoyas to the national championship two more times in the next three years, including winning it all against the University of Houston and Hall of Famer Akeem Olajuwon. Going into that 1985 draft, Ewing was expected to be the number one pick, and due to a change in draft rules, more teams would have a shot at winning the lottery and getting the number one pick. Now, in a very if-you-know-you-know you know NBA draft, David Stern, a known Knicks fan, would pull a slightly bent envelope out of that lottery machine that unsurprisingly gave his hometown Knicks the chance to draft a generational player. Whether it was rigged or not is besides the point, the Knicks would lock Ewing up with a 10-year, $32 million contract which was nuts at the time, pretty much saying that this is the next legendary big man for this iconic franchise. And even though his rookie year was a little bit injury riddled, he still averaged 20 points per game, 9 rebounds, and 2 blocks, netting him top rookie honors as well as being the rookie of the year and making the all-star game. All as a rookie, by the way. His next season, he put up slightly better stats, but somehow with the Knicks ending up as pretty much the same terrible team as the year before. His third season would show his third change of coaching, as Rick Pitino, yes, that is the same Rick Pitino, would help helm the Knicks and give Ewing his first breakout season and first playoff performance. He would make the playoffs for the first time in his career, and even though the Knicks would go out in the first round, Ewing had established himself as one of the best centers in the NBA, as once again he was an all-star, as well as being all-NBA second team and all-NBA defensive second team as well. While scoring and rebounding stayed pretty much the same with 20.2 points per game and 8.2 rebounds, he would average 3 blocks a game and continue to improve his shooting efficiency, which was at 55%. These numbers would once again improve in his fourth season, and the Knicks would win 50 games and yet again make the playoffs, with Ewing having another incredible season, scoring over 20 points per game, and that was his fourth year in a row. He would once again back up his scoring, blocking, and efficiency, this time as the Knicks would sweep the 76ers in the first round. 
setting up a matchup with the upstart Chicago Bulls, yes, headed by their own young star in Michael Jordan. Back again. The Knicks would be defeated in six games, but it showed that Ewing was without a doubt the face of the franchise and the center that they had been looking for all this time since Willis Reed. They had the ability to get the Knicks back to the NBA Finals, and sensing this, Ewing took his game to the next level. He would jump from 22.7 points to 28.6, 10.9 rebounds, and four blocks a game. However, in their second round, they would match up with the defending champs and the Detroit Pistons, and they would be outmatched and defeated in five games. But again, it showed that this team had the potential. They could do it. They could make it to the NBA Finals, but they just had to get there, and that was really the difficult part. I mean, in an East that was growing more difficult by the day, how was that going to happen? How were they going to transform this team that still seemed a couple pieces away to a championship contender? Well, the 90-91 season was pretty much the same. Ewing put together an all-star season again, and they were once again defeated by the Chicago Bulls, this time a crushing 3-0 defeat in the first round. The Knicks needed that spark, and they needed it now. The next season, they'd get it. Legendary coach Pat Riley would helm the Knicks, and the emergence of John Starks and Mark Jackson would make them one of the most dangerous teams in the East. Ewing would once again have a double-double season, averaging 24 points per game, 11.2 rebounds, and 3 blocks, and they tied with the best record in the division and settled in the fourth seed, where they'd match up with another old foe in the Detroit Pistons. They'd take them out in a close five-game series to book a rematch with, yep, guess who, the Chicago Bulls. Time and time again, Michael Jordan had thwarted the Knicks' chances at making it to the conference finals, but this time, they were back and better than ever. They split the first two highly contested games and then ended up splitting the first four before Jordan put them ahead in game five. Looking to respond in the garden, they held Jordan to just nine of 25 and sent the game back to Chicago for a game seven. Now, if this were any other team with any other guy, the Knicks might have had a chance in Game 7, but it's Michael Jordan we're talking about, and he sent them home with a 40 bomb and a 29 point defeat. This had been the closest Ewing had gotten to finally making it to the Conference Finals, and it had once again come to the hands of Michael Jordan. He beat him in the National Championship game. He just keeps stopping in the playoffs. Something has to change. Everybody knew that if you wanted to make it out of the East, you had to go through the Bulls. So the Knicks had no choice. They just simply had to put on their hoop and shoes and get to work. And they responded big. Ewing would help lead them to a franchise record 60 games and once again have an all-time all-NBA season. This time averaging a career high with 21.1 rebounds to go along with 24.2 points per game. Now, the Knicks were the number one seed. They had won 60 games. They cruised through a first round matchup with the Pacers, but a second round matchup with the Hornets also gave them no trouble. I mean, this was it. The Knicks had won 60 games, they were in the conference finals, and they're playing the Chicago Bulls again. Of course, they'd be playing the Chicago Bulls again, but New York had hope. This wasn't the same Knicks team. This wasn't the same team that had gone out sorry those past two years. This was the first time they'd been in the conference finals since 1974, and they would have to defeat the back-to-back -back champions they wanted to make it to the finals. The Knicks would take the first two games finally looking to shake off their demons, but when your demons are a man by the name of Michael Jordan, there is no stopping him, and there was no way that Jordan would let the Bulls lose as he would help them win the next four straight to complete the comeback and finish off his first three-peat. I mean, at this point, it seemed like the only way the Knicks were going to make the finals as if, like, Jordan retired to go play baseball or something like that. I mean, he's no Dave DeBusher, you know, but it, it, it would take something ridiculous. And something ridiculous happened. That year, Knicks fans would get an early Christmas as Michael Jordan would retire. Their devil in a red jersey, Michael Jordan, announced his retirement, and that meant that the East was wide open. The Knicks, that had just won 60 games, matched their franchise total, saw that. 
and they said, oh, it's our time. But the East was not just going to go easy. I mean, they won 57 games and established themselves as the favorites to make it out of the East. But just because Michael Jordan was gone does not mean that the Bulls were. They cruised in a first win series by beating the Nets 3-1. But Chicago was lurking once again in the second round. And with Scottie Pippen looking to prove that he was just not a second fiddle. He was that guy. He would help lead the Chicago Bulls. And yes, put an incredible poster on Ewing to Game 7 against this Knicks squad. This Knicks squad who had pretty much established themselves as the winners in the East. They pretty much said this is our season. Had gone to Game 7 against a Jordanless Bulls and were really on the verge of losing until a legendary, and I mean legendary series, ended with Ewing finally for the first time in his career, beating the Chicago Bulls in the playoffs. And they would get their chance to play for the finals by having to play against another rival in Reggie Miller's Indiana Pacers. I mean, this man became pretty much the most hated man in New York as a basketball fan in the 90s, mostly because of his antics during the many series he played against the Knicks. This one was another legendary seven game series as both teams split the first two games, but the Knicks would fall in game five at the Garden and battle back in game six in Indiana to send the series back to game seven with their finals hopes on the line. And just like Willis Reed did time and time again, Patrick Ewing would have a legacy game. I mean, this was easily his legacy game. 24 points, 22 rebounds, 11 of which were offensive, 7 assists, and 5 blocks. I mean, come on. You couldn't ask for a better legacy game to help lead the Knicks and come back in the fourth quarter to book themselves a trip to the NBA Finals, where he would match up against another familiar foe, a foe that he had once defeated in the national championship game, Hakeem Olajuwon. This series is infamous for many reasons in Knicks fans' hearts. Yes, I will not go into detail about the John Starks game. I will spare you people. And I promise that is the last time you will ever come up the rest of this video. You're safe. The Knicks would blow a 3-2 lead and lose a heartbreaking game seven against the Rockets. And this would end up as Ewing's best chance to win a finals. As the next four years, he would be defeated in the semis in a various amount of heartbreaking crushing ways, including a game seven against the Pacers, where his game tying finger roll would come just short in giving the Knicks another shot at the Western Conference Finals and another chance at the finals as a whole. In all these years until his injuries started to pile up in 1997, he was elite and in every way the premier big man for his time in the 90s. He would get one more crack at the finals as his Cinderella Knicks squad would miraculously advance to the finals in the lockout short in 1999 season, but a nagging Achilles injury would keep him out of the finals as the Knicks would fall 4-1. At the end of his Knicks career, it became evident that Ewing was the player that embodied the franchise. To this day, he is the only Knicks player in franchise history to play over a thousand games and is probably the most memorable Knicks player to ever wear the jersey. And even though he never won a championship, his name will always be famous in the streets of New York, just like how his number 33 jersey hangs from the rafters. Our three contenders for Franchise GOAT are all hard hitters and all have relatively close stats. I do think that there's one major factor that sets them apart, and I'm going to explain why in a bit. But first, let's go through all three of these legends and compare their accolades. Ewing played the most seasons for the Knicks out of this bunch, with 15 topping both Reed and Frazier's 10 seasons each. He also has the all-time record for points for the franchise, with 23,665, which is pretty far ahead of both Reed and Frazier again. To even further his case, his All-NBA total stands at 7, which is 2 more than Reed and 1 more than Frazier. Now, we're going to skip over MVPs for a second and jump straight to championships. Reed and Frazier having two apiece, and Ewing failing to win the finals and being injured during the second defeat. He does bounce back with having the most amount of win shares at 123, which is far better ahead of Reed's 74.9 and better than Frazier's 108.8. Now, just doing the eye test here, it's pretty clear that Ewing should be the franchise go for the Knicks. I mean, he's pretty much front running in all these stats here, but 
there's one reason why I don't think he is. Now, obviously, many people associate Ewing with the franchise goat. I mean, he is synonymous with the Knicks teams of the 90s, and his legacy playing for that squad has made him pretty much one of the most beloved players ever, not to mention one of the best centers of all time. I mean, he definitely has that major factor going for him, but there, I believe, is one major factor that stops him from being the franchise goat. And that is Willis Reed. Not only does he have the only MVP in franchise history, he also has the only two finals MVPs in franchise history. In addition, they only won the finals in 1970 and 1973, largely because of his help, and they would have won those 72 finals had he not missed the whole season with injury. Now, while Frazier went on to surpass most of his stats, without Reed, there's no finals victories for the Knicks. There are no MVP winners for the Knicks. Reed is the first Knicks player for the entire franchise to get his jersey retired, and had his career not been cut short due to injury, there is no doubt in my mind that the Knicks would have more than two finals victories, thanks in large part to Reed's efforts. That's why, in my opinion, Willis Reed is the greatest player in New York Knicks history. But what do you guys think? This is a pretty close contest between these three, and I'd love to know what everybody else thinks in the comment section below. Remember to go to the community tab on YouTube and vote as well, as the poll will be up after the video. Either way, what do you guys think about this episode of the Case for Franchise Goat? Are there any players that you think I missed, or anybody you feel like this should be on the list? Let me know down in the comment section below, and don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, ring that bell for post notifications, and take it easy. Let me know who you guys want next time, and I'll catch y'all on the next one. As always, Thanks for watching. Take it easy. Peace.